Asking for it. A novel approach. Episode 8. Chapter 29. I want to build something. I don't need someone gifting me heaven and earth. They want a goddess? Well, don't we all? They don't exist. Get over it. God is dead. They missed the memo? I'm not asking for an empire. I just want a paycheck. Honest day's work for an honest day's pay. Michaela has covered a good ten miles, and the horizon begins to pale when she realizes she may be overdoing things. She deeks back down to the beach, does some stretching, and heads off again, walking this time. The cool, damp sand comes up in little clumps from her heels as she gains momentum. She stops long enough to pry off her trainers and socks, then resumes walking, head down a little, eyes unfocused. The beach stretches out before her, dark sand gradually silvering with the approach of dawn. The rush and tumble of a lively surf complements her internal monologue, finally grown more monotonous than obsessed. One hour later, the light is diffuse in Brandy's living room. Sheer champagne drapes allow the early morning light to filter in, the room's deep pile broad loom is topped by a plush white throw rug where Brandy lounges, one leg drawn up under her, in the center of her dusty pink leather sofa. Her hair is tussled, bathrobe and worn fuzzy slippers. She stifles a yawn, sips from a mug of coffee, stares for a moment with an irritated expression at the little laptop on the white throw before her. A little gasp of shock and indignation escapes her when the doorbell sounds. After a second's hesitation, she glares at the laptop once more and hurries off to the door. Michaela's sweaty, bedraggled, apologetic smile surprises Brandy. She ushers her into the house and beats a beeline back to the living room, explaining the rush over her shoulder. Bank director in Tokyo! Only time he can get his wallet and his little wiener out at the same time. She puts her finger to her lips as they enter the living room, then briefly consults the laptop screen. Not there yet. Okay, so, you look strange. What the hell are you doing out so early? There's coffee in the kitchen. This will only take about, I don't know, ten minutes. You want to watch? Oh, that's him. Michaela retreats to the kitchen. She pulls up a tall stool to Brandy's island countertop. A three-day-old Miami Herald is open to page one of the business section. Too big to fail no longer. The uninspired leaves her cold. She hears Brandy begin berating her online victim. The harangue moves on quickly from cliched bow-to-your-mistress style preliminaries with very few, very brief, and very quiet replies. After Brandy's long and quite creative listing of her slave benefactor's duties, Michaela's fatigue obscures her friend's voice. The kitchen's many tiled surfaces are awash with the sunrise colors. The faux homespun cornflower motif reminds Michaela of childhood. Fields of blue on the edge of town, centerpieces on friends' parents' dining room tables. After a while, Brandy's raised voice cuts back into Michaela's reverie. I don't give a shit about your quarterlies. You need to focus on my dailies. You think I'm going to remember to look for your email once a week and go clicking around after your transfers? Michaela lets curiosity carry her back to the threshold separating living room from dining room. Brandy is hunched forward a little, glowering over the little laptop on the throw. Her lips and jaws are working subtly, her expression that of someone that's bitten into something bitter. She rears back a little and spits messily directly into the laptop's display. Look at me. Listen to me. Do what I say. You're Japanese, fuck. You should get this. Now kowtow, motherfucker. And when you're done groveling, get your IT department to work on my tributes. Brandy relaxes back into the divan, sneers, smiles, 
drums her fingers on one knee in a parody of waving goodbye. After another moment, she looks over to Michaela and shrugs. Extending one slippered foot, she taps the lid of the MacBook Air shut with a little flourish. A hint of amusement creeps into her expression, and the two friends burst into laughter simultaneously. I'll uh, clean that up a little later. My God, you're good at that. All that looking down your nose stuff? You're very convincing. What's he good for, if uh, not for his money? (laughs) And that bit, um, what was it? Tongue grooming your cat's asses? (laughs) Priceless. How do you come up with that stuff? Their glory hole scratching post? Really? That's just crazy shit. And you're so deadpan. Well, coming from a goddess, that's high praise. Uh, I don't know. He still only coughs up about a C note at a time. Wow. How much in a week? Kayla, did you flunk math or something? Seven times a hundred? Every day? He throws you a hundred bucks every day of the week. Hasn't skipped a day yet. What, you don't think I'm worth it? I have to practice this shit, you know. She glares at Michaela. In three successive stages, she conveys irritation, disdain, and finally disgust. Hmm, impressive. Not too much, uh, Elvis? <laughs> she hitches up one end of her upper lip in the idol's signature sneer. They have another giggle at this. All right. Enough of this bullshit. Why are you turning up here, all sketchy-looking, on my doorstep at 6.30 in the morning? Is everything all right? Brandy hasn't quite managed to drop the superior air cultivated for her wallet slave. She's still reclined a slant her divan, dangling her one fuzzy slipper like a dog treat. Michaela cracks up at the novel spectacle of her friend's new persona. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm fine. <laughs> sorry, it's just you're still doing some of it. Brandy bristles at this. So you're all finey fine. Well, I guess you'll just be running along home again? Oh, no, no, no. I, I didn't say I couldn't use some... I mean, there are some... Michaela takes a deep breath, realizes she could cry. I don't know. I think my mother's fucking with my head. Why would she do that? We speak maybe once a month. Why she make it like that's once too often? Why, Brandy? Chapter 30 The brown shag carpet, beaten flat at the foot of the couch, is giving Lance a mild case of nausea. A single sliver of daylight reveals dust motes rising from the armchair when Dick slings his laptop case there upon arrival. Too little daylight, too little fresh air. Lance is hovering in the room's doorway, promising himself this will be a visit never to be repeated. He looks over to Dick. The hulking PC's monitor is painting this guy's face variously lurid shades of bruised blue-gray. Listen, Dick. I'm not a really a porn guy, you know? Yeah, I know, Lance. But that's where I come in, isn't it? And maybe you're just a teensy bit lucky that way. You know, I put a lot of hours into researching this stuff. Yeah, um, research can take a whole lot of time and energy. That really wears you out, huh? Okay, you can laugh, but look at this, for example. Warily and feigning infinite weariness... Lance enters and crosses the small room, moves around Dick's desk, and looks over the porn aficionado's shoulder. On the screen is a whole lot of text. Dick scrolls down the web page, successive text-filled fields, separated by bands of black and violet, each headed with a new subject in orange titles. He reaches page bottom, clicks through to the next page, identically text-laden, Down to the bottom, click, repeat, the next the same. Pretty smutty stuff, right? Well, I can't say as I've taken much in. Well, it's a thread in a fan forum. This one, let's see, four pages long. Subject, the price of going down. This post here elaborates 
Times I've Paid With My Skin, subtitled Transcending My Personal Credit Crunch. Some good humor in here, Lance. Want to see what's way back at the top? I've got a feeling I'm about to. Well, here we go. As Dick lets his finger off the mouse, the screen fills with an action shot of Michaela. Her upper arm is flexed across the foreground. Her mildly strained expression is in soft focus and half obscured by her whirling chestnut locks. Lance's imagination fills out the shot with her fist following through from a blow, an anonymous opponent's shocked face snapping away out of the frame, blood, sweat, or merely a contorted grimace. I took that one myself. This thread was started back in April. There's probably not more than a couple of pics uploaded here in the whole, let's see, 96 posts. See what I mean? Michaela's fans like to read. Perverts aren't all slack-jawed zombies like you might think, huh? Sure, you gotta account for a whole bunch of lurkers, too, but bottom line is these forums are like genuine subcultures. Regular chatty Cathy's, aren't they? I'm serious. Wait. Dick opens a new window. Fingers a blur for an instant, a long and severally backslashed web address takes them to another Michaela forum. He navigates smoothly to a half-page long post, then reads aloud to Lance. I was in Stockholm last week on business, dropped into Svensong's place. Hamburg on the same trip, third time over this year, at least one dungeon per. Is it just me, or is all Europe still caught up in the whole whips and chains thing? Arg Michaela could teach him something about substance and erotic aesthetics. Long live the casual dom. Go USA! Oh, very sophisticated, uh, embarrassing patriotic sports references aside. Lance, with all due respect, I think you may be missing the point. These were just two out of a dozen fan pages I'm aware of. All dedicated to you-know-who. She's in forums galore. And our clips are probably among the most widely reposted around. Go up on the bunker, Euro sluts, any of the biggies. She hasn't shown so much as a little tit, and Michaela is in play worldwide. And I'm just all about any level you want to talk about. Highbrow right down to the local yokels. Just saying. She can still make a lot of ground online. Maybe it's too soon to pass on a porn career. What do you think? When she does go legit, what about licensing, I don't know, games? No offense, but... Hollywood ain't the powerhouse she used to be, is she? Grudging the allowance, Lance's estimation of Dick is rising gradually. Lance actually thinks this to himself, then winces at the number of smutty puns cropping up in his mind these days. Disturbing. At any rate, Michaela's online eminence is something of a revelation. It reminds Lance of a statistic he's read somewhere recently. Think you're one in a thousand? If you are, it means there are about 2.5 million others just like you. All checking out just what you're checking out online. What happens to the niches then? The internet is making grand canyons of the niches. Accepting Dick's command of entertainment media, Lance is somewhat impressed. He'd like to see some real numbers and a creative strategy for channeling Michaela's prolific spin, channel it, monetize it. How to take this internet tiger by the tail, get Michaela the ride of her life, and at the same time keeping it from mauling her. Chapter 31 Lance is happy. They had a Panamera at the rental agent's. Something about this car's constellation of luxury and performance features gives him the sense of being ready for anything. The automobile is a vessel of our lives, an intimate locus for our desires. It extends us out into the world at large. At the same time, we're cocooned inside a car, 
even as it hurtles to us through space. Certain cars can move certain types of persons, even while parked at the curb. Lance has been traveling in time ever since he parked the Panamera half an hour ago. He checks the rear-view mirrors again. In the passenger's side, he can see the alley's entrance, a dark rectangle cut from the row of gaudy storefronts. In the driver's side, a sparse flow of traffic in twilight, an almost eerily quiet street for this part of town. Venice Beach. A funhouse mirror for America. Still keeping its own time, a place for playing against the grain. It's many different drummers forever marching. Forward in all directions. For Lance, the denizens' liminal lifestyles coalesced in one long and inexplicable celebration. It was the end of the 70s. A young Canadian, Lance felt he'd earned escape from his suburban haunts north of Toronto. The new and sprawling university campus there lacked soul. It seemed to be continually self-propagating, buildings popping up, connecting to last year's new buildings, but the entire complex never quite acquired a character. He saw that, too. And so he went truant during semester three, the summer session in his B.A. English Lit. Little more than a week later, a newly experienced hitchhiker, Lance Abierti, arrived in L.A. Student loan in his pocket, he began a delirious year studying the eccentric left coast of contemporary American life. Big, brash America had been strapped unsuspecting into some mad psychedelicist's laboratory chair. The social experiment went on and on. Most of the willing subjects had come too far to turn back. Further ahead and you'd topple into the Pacific. From the beach boardwalk, back up the avenues and along the surviving canals, pretensions to every sort of cultural sophistication vied for influence with generations of blatant hipsterism and with the still sturdier stock of homespun American know-how. Forget Broadway. If you could make it homeless in Venice, you really could make it anywhere. And if you couldn't make it, at least you didn't freeze sleeping rough. The traffic is beginning to pick up. The sun sets in a swift and silent plunge. Lance lowers the tinted windows of his rented Panamara. The heat and the neighborhood's distinctive blend of exhaust fumes and salty ocean breeze displace the car's air-conditioned aromas of leather and cleaning products. So he is actually doing this, facilitating the rise of an American goddess. Strange to think of the star-maker machinery in this case. The traditional tool of the profiteer needed to be put in thrall. Was it Marilyn? the last true American goddess? Michaela is almost the anti-Marilyn. Her eyes can remind you of the screen idols, come hither peepers, but from there everything goes off in the opposite direction. None of the vulnerability, breathy, whispering invitations, fill me gowns or teetering heels, that's for sure. Jim's could be right. They could be building a temple, a temple to a star risen millennia before the birth of Hollywood. Absurd, yet bizarrely, seemingly doable. God bless the West, thinks Lance. It's all possible. In the alleyway's dark rectangle appears the unkempt figure of a 70s hipster gone to seed. Lance swings his door open to confront the specter before it can vanish. Last of the great American beats. How are you, Manfred? Last to have every bone broken on the rack of America's indifference, maybe. How and why in the God's name have you found me? You iconoclasts, you throw a long shadow, Manfred. I've finally found a subject worthy of your intense scrutiny. She'll blow your skeptical ass away. Manfred Meekness harumphs inaudibly. He looks anxiously up and down the street, 
fingers plucking his grubby black t-shirt from the waistband of his skinny black denims. Having gained access, he scratches his meager belly with consummate nonchalance, shrugs and heads off up the sidewalk. Lance beeps the Panamera, door locks thump and tinted windows rise to seal up the car's interior. He falls in step beside Meekness, head down, quietly matching his stride, awaiting a sign that the writer will listen further. She, huh? Coffee. They head up the street to a hole-in-the-wall cafe Lance hasn't even noticed until Meekness turns, wrenches open a flimsy bamboo door, and enters. Abierti's eyes adjust to the dim interior just in time to avoid bumping into Meekness where he has stopped a step or two inside. The writer tests the air with long, leisurely inhalations. One, two, three of them. Bud! An obscure grunt of response issues from somewhere beyond the vacant bar. What do the beans say? The beans say never better, freakness, never better. Ah, good enough then. And they sit in the gloom. It is just possible to discern framed black and white photographs of famous punches thrown in the ring, of thoroughbreds crossing the line, and the odd celebrity from the worlds of song or screen. Enough light penetrates the dusty chintz in the window to reveal an equally dusty-looking cat on the counter next to a vintage cash register. A man, about six foot six and half as wide, lumbers out from a back room carrying a tray with two short espressos. He is in his late fifties, sweat-sour, coffee-stained t-shirt, and a breathing hard. For a split second, Lance considers asking for a latte. Manfred Meekness reads his expression and smiles to himself. The man sets down the espressos and retreats without a word. Still can't drink real coffee, huh? A youthful misery rises like bile in Lance's throat. It's more bitter than the coffee. A second later, it's vanished, though. He's barely noted the old sting of being judged predictable, soft core. The evident penury his old rival still inhabits mutes his big dog bark. Lance is betting there's more bite left in his print. Balls out bravado, tempered by grandmotherly insights and troubled with a debutante's wiles. That was the meekness that always humbled him back in the day. Lance still hasn't encountered his equal where it comes to what the scribbler himself used to call dramedy of the sexes. So, this is what we've got. Buxom brunette beauty with a playful penchant for beating up men. Product of a broken home, bound for glory. Willing slaves paving her way. Modern legend. Animated superhero could be. I've got a story, but... A story! You have a story. True to life stuff, dense and sprawling at the same time. I've tried to clean it up for a script. You! You're trying on a screenplay. Well, I'm not sure I can fit it in. I have a little brain surgery I've promised to try out. And at least three nation states are waiting on me to finish up nuclear arms projects. Not sure I can take on a paltry little writing project just now. I've given it up, Manfred. I've brought it to the master. Puh. The last beat standing. The master. Last great master beat. See where I'm going with this? I don't know. Grand Pooba of the most awesome Jinwa? All the ass kissing in the world will not cure my fathomless disdain for the past master baiter. Well, how about three figures right now? Lance places three crisp hundred-dollar bills on the scarred tabletop between them. Four figures upon completion of a first draft. Five if it sells. Manfred, it could be six if things really blow up down the road. 
Nobody else in this pit of greed and thieves would keep you in the loop like I can, would they? Five brothers, Benjamin, and I'll read your dense sprawl, friend. Rent is due, but you may have nothing but caca. She's going to squeeze you dry, Manfred. She's going to squeeze you dry. You're going to wish you had two dicks. I got more dicks than there's pricks in Texas. If you're still in town tonight, bring me a jug of Ripple and we'll talk. Otherwise, wooden nickels, Lance. Wooden nickels. Ten minutes later, the thick envelope of Michaela uncut slides easily beneath the hipster's rickety door frame. Lance holds his breath at the tang of mixed urines rife in the dim alleyway. Back in the Panamera, he iPhones the next possible flight to Miami. He's not about to risk a drinking bout with the vernacular bard of Venice Beach. Too many ghosts of school day grievances await there. Chapter 32 the crew-cut clean recruit and the little bodybuilder in the do-wrap exchange glances through their respective car windows. The casual set of the recruit's jaw and her business-like demeanor aggravate the diminutive Latina in the lane next to her. Across her face a sneer unravels like a rattlesnake. She hunkers down until the black paisley do-wrap is all that's visible in the window frame. Then the lights change. Looking like she's just stole the 80s Pontiac she drives, the do-wrapped thug lays rubber and pulls away from the lights fast. The lipstick cadet has an Audi, though, and easily catches up alongside. Do-wrap peels off into an alley that ends opposite the parking lot behind Teddy's place. Teddy is holding forth to a half-dozen young women at a picnic table in her backyard. Black denim, sweatpants, and combats, khaki and camouflage, punk to punctilious, the group sport their own takes on a generally paramilitary look. One couple favors skinny white wife-beater tank tops that reveal faux jailhouse tattoos covering shoulders and biceps. The space is fenced around, eight feet high. The chain link is woven through with green plastic ribbon to form a windbreak and a blind. Having established the dangerous distractions of American foreign policy, Teddy pauses her heated diatribe. The pressing need for domestic reforms will have to wait. Her widening grin suggests she can take credit for something wonderful about to happen. She cocks her head, to an alert angle and narrows her eyes. A vague and distant throb in the air grows clearer, dies away for a moment, then roars like automatic weapon fire not far outside their enclosure. Teddy walks to the metallic green wall and opens a gate within it. Her curious guests get up and follow her to that gate. They're all pretty fit, like a military review, or the welcoming line of a football team entering a stadium, they form a brief double cordon just inside the gate. The roar has slowed to the syncopated percussion of an idling Harley Davidson. With a final hiccup, it dies off altogether. A mandala wears her abbreviated guardsman's jumpsuit, oily black jump boots, and a little black pudding bowl of a helmet. She leaves her black and chrome chopper, a hundred cubic inch modern Evo outfit, leaning meanly on the near edge of the parking lot. She's just unbuckling her helmet, heading over toward Teddy and the open gate, when a beat-up Pontiac careens into the lot at speed, bounces and screeches to a stop. A red Audi pulls in quickly, though smoothly close behind. Durap and the cadet thump their doors shut behind them and exchange vaguely hostile looks as they stride over to the gate. Teddy is staring daggers at both of them. A mandala's entrance has been upstaged. And that's a queen's entrance, mind you. 
a mandala has never identified as anything less. Most of the sisters made obsequious with brothers coming up in their hood. They knew not what they did. How else to impress at that age? Where some of those sisters lay down in less than elegant circumstances, a mandala always rose up instead. She'd always been a tall girl. In puberty, she was already an athletic six-footer. She raised her chin, and even the biggest brothers caught the whiff of royalty. Mostly, they stepped the hell off from her. The biker doesn't miss a beat. Just follows the others into the yard, unfazed. Teddy gives the sweetly smiling do-rap a sharp smack on the back of the head as she passes in through the gate. The cadet looks more contrite and receives no more than Teddy's focused look of disdain. Back, congregated around the picnic table, Teddy introduces Amandala, the National Guard she's told them to expect for drills today. Amandala did a stint in the Navy as well before fully realizing she'd end up killing someone for real that way. So she'd grown a conscience and at that first honorable opportunity, switched out to the guard. Teddy didn't need to advertise when she got the idea to start up an advanced self-defense group for women. Her boisterous habit of slagging off macho types in the bars and cafes around Port St. Lucie gave her a profile among the angry young woman set. And those A-Y-W's numbers were growing. The little group gathered in her backyard today is merely the hardcore of a 20s and 30s demographic that includes students, blue-collar types and professionals, black, white, Latina, Asian, dykes, and the unenlightened alike. Teddy is proud of her role as catalyst for these women. They aren't in New York City, after all. There are still a lot of women down here not getting that baby mama does not really amount to a career trajectory. Advanced self-defense was an easy sell. Advanced self-defense. For Teddy, it's really just a euphemism for feminism. Men are a fact of life, but that doesn't mean you can trust them. A reasoned feminist perspective cannot fail to anticipate male aggression. Mandela has them do some painful, low, slow squats, broiling under the sun. They do push-ups down in the dirt, climb to the top of that chain-link fence and drop back down over and over again until Teddy questions her sanity inviting this abuse. When it is over, Amandala promises she'll be back to teach them some hand-to-hand -hand combat. But in the meantime, she encourages them all to repeat today's drills on a regular basis. No fancy kung fu is going to help you if you're just weak as shit in the first place. Class dismissed. They have a bottle of water and or a can of beer each, lounging around the picnic table, playfully complaining of aches and pain. When the others have all taken off, Teddy gives the mandala a grateful, weary smile and goes inside to get second beers. She is still sweat-stained and red in the face when she sits back down at the picnic table, peels the tops off the Budweiser's, and pops a question she's had on her mind for a week. Mandela, how do you feel about pornography? How you mean how I feel about it? You mean how I like my eggs? You're into it? One level or another, Teddy, we all into it. Don't have to skulk around in the racks at X video, you know. There's TV, movies, God damn it, there's advertising. Telling me you don't check out those American junkie girls? Excuse me, American apparel girls? Well, that's true, uh, but I was thinking about online porn. Woman-run sites, specifically. Think there's a good argument for giving it up online for money? Well, ain't exactly anonymous anymore, is it? That's a security issue. Putting your pink cracker ass out there be a damn shame, you ask me. Ha <laughs> uh, ha, no. No, I'm, I'm thinking more like creating safe spaces for horny sisters online. Ho, oui. 
Wait, this about that boxer girlfriend of yours, ain't it? Girl, she ain't no fool what you're telling me is half true. Getting your tidy white isn't a jealous little knot there. Got one word for you, perspective. Don't let shit mess with your mind. She be fine, whether she be giving you any or not. She has tried to interrupt and protest Amandala's response, but it's been delivered direct and with no little authority. Teddy's forehead wrinkles as she frowns, self-consciously acknowledging having been called out. They touch beers across the table. Teddy half sighs, half growls resignation at her transparent vulnerability. She slumps, pouts and stretches her arms out for the world to give her a hug. Amandala busts out a laugh that serves as a final word on the subject.